I want to talk um, about the book, but I first, but I first want to um, talk a little bit about the book when when you two first encountered one another. Did you encounter one another with a full um, manuscript of a story collection or not? How did this come to you, Susan, and what were your thoughts at that point? Well, I was at the Squaw Valley Writers' Conference, and um, the writer, Daga Berto Gill, whose book I saw very nicely downstairs, was sharing a um, house with me, and he came back one day from a workshop he had done and said that there was this writer, a jaw-dropping writer, that um, had everybody in her class just sort of stunned. And um, so when I had the same class Chris was in, the following day I had a heads up about her. And I was also equally just very impressed with, um, in these writers' conferences, you know, a, a story is done in each class and then everybody else critiques it, and um, Chris's comments were so insightful and concise, and yet she was so generous, and I was so impressed that here was clearly a writer's mind, and a writer who just knew what she was doing. And it was after that that I think I asked you for some stories, I, for the story that was being workshopped, and you had some others, was, I think, The Temporary Marriage, and what else did you think about it? Um, I think at that point, uh, Susan had asked me for if I had a complete manuscript, and I said, well, I only have a partial. I'm still working on the collection. And we, um, we discussed it, and I decided to... And then you gave me a bunch to read on the plane back, I remember. Yeah. Yes, um, I think by the end of the uh, conference, Susan had come to me on Friday and said, well, I'd like to work with you. And at that point, she took the stories back to give me some edits, mm -hmm. so I started there. Right. Can you tell me what brought you to that conference? What What had you been doing up until that point? Where were you in the evolution of your writing at the moment that you were in the workshop at that conference? Well, I was living in Seoul, Korea, where I've been for a very long time, so I felt quite distanced from any kind of writing world or circle at all. And my first real encounter with more writers was through Squaw Valley, a conference like that. And then next, that led me to the Warren Wilson MFA program. So when I was closer to finishing a uh, book, I wanted to go back to that conference and s come back in a different place and see if, if anything would happen or if at least I would come out with a better story. So you did the Warren um, Wilson program while you were living in Seoul? Yes, I was, I, I was lucky enough to get a scholarship, so that allowed me to travel back and forth. It only requires two full residencies out here. The rest of the time, you can actually be anywhere in the world and still work. There's quite a few students who do that. Mm -hmm. So at the conference, you approached her after you saw her at the workshop? And yeah. And I was I was that impressed with her story, and I'm rarely that impressed to conferences. And you'd only seen one story. I think well, then I think you had a couple on you, so it was I read a couple more before I asked her if I could represent her. That was very good to have a couple on you. <laughs> it was on my laptop. So I suddenly became very busy. You know, I wasn't socializing the evenings, and I was busy. Oh, I remember that. Too. You're trying to print them out. Yeah. Print and <laughs> and what did you know about Susan when she approached you? Did you know anything at all about her? I'm one of the most, I, at, at this point, I'm in a very different space, but at that time, I was one of the most ignorant people about anything concerning publishing, just because I'm so far away from um, this place and my work and my concerns and career are so different. So I, I just, I knew what I'd read in the biography, only later when, uh, you know, other people were so excited that Susan was interested in my work. And of course, I knew that she must have been a great agent, she was there, but I learned more very quickly. Mm -hmm. And Susan was not only just a, a great agent in the sense of being able to find, I think, new writers and really help them along in their careers, but also just very generous. Because at that Friday, when uh, she decided to take the stories with her, 
she took them on vacation and, and she used up a little bit of her real, and maybe more than a little bit of her holiday time. She buried that memory. She gave me those edits, and that was very generous. You said, Susan, you were really impressed by the story and by the other stories that Chris gave you. What impressed you about them? What is the quality in her writing that draws you to her so much? Well, um, I mean, The Believer is a particularly tough story. I mean, that is a pretty harrowing story. And um, I think generally Chris has a, a wonderful combination of facility with language and lyricism, but also an efficiency. So sometimes you have it in the same paragraph. And often it's it's there's a lot of humor there. So they'll start out um, not quite florid, but um, lyrical, and then end up with like a short, very funny sentence. So you get sort of a, a surprise and a pow. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very drawn to, to material that does have humor, that um, has subtle humor, because I think a great writer understands the human condition and mm -hmm. where would we be without the absurdities of life. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Can you tell the audience just a little tiny few lines about The Believer so that they know? Well, The Believer is um, one of the stories where it's about a young girl who's been brought up and to be very Christian and to really believe in God until one day her mother goes crazy and, well, I don't know if I want to give it away. Don't give it away. Yeah. <laughs> and it starts very early in the story, something very brutal and surprising, and then goes further, which is which is um, unexpected to have something so climactic up front and yet still find a further climax. Yeah. Yeah. It makes it such a wonderful story because it, you're right. I mean, it just you you just feel like it's doesn't stop coming at you, and you don't quite know what to do, yeah. but that's what makes it so powerful. Um, the stories in the collection um, are just, there's a really wide range of kind of um, tone almost. Some of them are, are really difficult, some of them are um, more lyrical, some of them are funnier. I mean, it's, did you do that purposely, or is that just how your writing unfolds for you? I think each each story that you're attracted to immediately um, invites a certain point of view and a tone, and usually it comes in the first sentence for me. There's some sentence that will help me enter the narrative, and from there on it becomes very, a much easier story to write because you already have the voice of the story. And I, I really let that, I trust that instinct. I don't know, sometimes maybe this isn't the right point of view. I don't question that though, because usually I find that that's the right way to go. And the same with the tone. I mean, I think it's like life. I think of it that way. The stories, try, I try to reflect how I experience life and how I see it. And I think it is a kind of hard journey for so many of us, but at the same time, there's a lot of, there's a lot of life, there's strangeness, there's the curveball, and you somehow have to keep going. Yeah. So I'm really interested in survivors, but survivors also have a sense of humor. <laughs> mm -hmm. did, did you work closely on putting this book together, the two of you? Um, uh, the order of the stories, the, how, it would, how it would be presented, you know, just um, assembling a collection. Was that something that you did all, and just hand it over to Susan, or did you work together? Uh, we would work together on them. There was um, Chris had more than one, had more stories than what ended up in the collection, and so we worked to make sure that it was balanced, that the subject matter was balanced, <coughs> and there wasn't any kind of repetition. Um, and we worked with tone. We felt that a temporary marriage was an easier story to to begin with until you got to some of the really heavy stuff, including the title story and the believer. Yes, and I think that was actually very important for me when I met Susan. I knew I wanted to work with, with her because she really just understood good books and fiction. The way she talked about books really excited me mm -hmm. and that she wanted to be involved in that editing process made me think that if I'm with an agent like Susan, years down the road, 
that will help me be just become a better writer. So I wasn't just thinking of this book, but the next book and the book right. after. I think that's very important for me. Well, when we were selling the book then, after I took on Chris, we were really looking for a write, an editor who would make her a better writer. She always just wanted to be a better writer, which is... Uh, so often I hear um, that more and more um, agents are playing an editorial role. Is that was that true for you, and is it true in general with, for you with the writers you work yes. with? Yes. Well, it's become very hard to sell fiction, and editors and editing houses are have a lot of pressure to spend their time acquiring and then shepherding books through the system. They don't really have the time to edit anymore, so they're looking for something pretty much ready to go, um, makes their job a lot easier, it's able to summon up the enthusiasm that the house needs and for them to feel confident that this book will come in on time, the revisions won't take too long and they can schedule it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I do do a lot of line editing, we did, we did a lot. Um, also, Chris is very immersed in, in her, the culture of Korea and there was so much that she she took for granted that an audience would know and Korean history, I learned a lot about Korean history and was sort of blown away by this poor country and the suffering it's gone through for decades and decades and when we submitted the novel I actually included a timeline of Korean history so that um, the context of which some of these stories were taking place would be um, easier for people to understand and appreciate. And you found her a, a very, very good house with wonderful yes, editors. Yeah, we've done everything out here. <laughs> but um, done a tremendous job. Do you want to talk about? Just I uh, wondered for a second what the relationship you what you found different, and was that a what kind of a transition was that for you working so closely with Susan, and then once the book was placed, working with an editor was that fairly seamless for you, or? It was incredibly seamless. I've had, I've been very lucky throughout with everyone I've met. I mean, mm -hmm. my editors are wonderful. I'm just mm -hmm. really, really, just very happy. Um, and I, I think that when you walk in, especially with something like a story collection, you know, it does have to be in, in very good shape for anyone to really, um, you know, take some. You know, it's a big risk for any book to be bought by a debut writer. But when, I came, when the book was bought by Viking, the editorial process there was really incredible as well, and I think it just made it a much better book. Mm -hmm. And that, I feel very lucky, and I'm looking forward to working on my novel through this mm -hmm. process too, because that will need a lot of help, and I trust that I'm going to get it. Yeah. Great editors and a great house. Uh -huh. so, you, so this was part of a two-book right. deal with a mm -hmm. novel. And is that in general what you try to do, Susan, with a story collection? Your hope is that there's a novel there as yeah, well? Yeah, the, the, um, story collections are difficult. And um, often the best way to sell them is with the promise of a novel. So if, if a writer does want to write a novel, I would never push a novel on someone who sees himself primarily as a short story writer. But Chris actually was really looking forward to the long form and found that with the novel she could do things that she couldn't do in stories. So I think it's exciting that the novel is now coming out. Mm -hmm. You were working on these stories over a number of years. There are stories that are both old and new stories included in this. Yes. Um, when the, the earliest story, when, when is it from? It was probably about five years from um, the actual date that uh, Viking had bought uh -huh. the collection. But during those, that period of time, I was also working three jobs and taking time away from writing because I was really afraid to write. I was afraid to commit and, in a sense, you invest so much time in something and you don't I, I saw it almost as a quantitative process until I went to the MFA program, and that really gave me the courage to be able to say out loud and take myself seriously as a writer, whatever what, happened. What were your other jobs? Were they completely unconnected to writing? I was teaching at a university. Uh -huh. I was also translating uh, uh -huh. poetry and some fiction, uh -huh. bringing it to English. Uh -huh. and. Um, my other job. I did some editing as well um, in, within a Korean literature organization. Uh -huh. So, oh, working with words. So not, it wasn't as if you were a veterinarian or something. <laughs> yeah. I wish you were a park ranger. That's my a park ranger. That's your fantasy job. Anyone wanting to hire me? <laughs> <laughs> okay.
keep that in mind. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the novel, or do you not want to talk about it at all? Well, it's a, uh, I have a complete draft and I'm revising it right now. It was much easier for me to work quickly with the novel because um, thanks to my book contract, I was able to not work the way I was, and I really am considering myself a full-time novelist at this point, full-time writer. Mm -hmm. um, it's a book concerning, well, for many years I've done work with North Korean defectors, and they're my friends, and they're part of my community, and it is a book concerning their story, the story that I feel like that hasn't been told on the Chinese border, a country that is probably not only violating the rights of their own people, but definitely um, really just destroying an entire country of people that are trying to get out and just live a decent life, find mm -hmm. food, safety, some kind of shelter. Mm -hmm. They're aggressively sending them back. But a lot of people take advantage of these defectors. And my story is about that, partially because I've had many years of experience mm -hmm. seeing it firsthand. Mm -hmm. But my third book will not be about North Korea. North Korea. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. That's fascinating. So are you already working on that book together? Uh, well, I saw the, we worked on a synopsis when we sold it, but no, I haven't seen this draft. I'm looking uh -huh. forward to whenever Chris is ready to show it. Can you tell me, Susan, a little bit about what in general you look for in a fiction writer, a young fiction writer or a first-time fiction writer, and how you find writers? Well, what I look for, it's, it's always the voice it's, um, and the level of characterization. Uh, Chris had very, very complex, very compelling characters, a wide assortment of them. Um, it's everything. It's the level of the sentence. It's, um, but I work with writers. If I, if, um, sometimes I find out of some programs, work comes very crafted and it's you know, beautifully nuanced and there's a lot of inference, and it, uh, they're very precious things, but that doesn't get me that excited. I like my sort of shaggy dogs more, where there's a, a real ambition and a voice, and um, then there's something that I don't look to find work to do, but if work needs to be done, I'm happy to do it if there's enough of a passion and enough of a book that has something to say and something we haven't seen before. Um, there's a second part to your question. Oh, and humor, where? too, is very important. And, and where do you find writers? I've been very lucky in that um, I get a lot of good referrals, but I also get an amazing slush pile. And I have wonderful assistants and interns who do a lot of the um, first reading for me. And uh, I found Tom Rackman, The Imperfectionist in Slush, and Sasha Kaisa, the special topic. Yeah. Um, but also at writers' conferences and sometimes just meeting people through the course of life. I mean, it could be at a dinner party or it could be talking to my eye doctor who knows somebody you never know. Um, there's good writers everywhere, as you know from your, mm -hmm. your awards. It's so interesting, though, because I think that, you know, for you, young writers in the audience, I think that there's the impression that, oh, well, no agent anymore ever picks anything out of a slush pile. No, they do. Um, and the best way is to write a really great query letter. I mean, the, that query has to grab, grab me in the first paragraph. There has to be something unique about it, and it has to be really well written, because that shows me that you can write. Um, but no, people that we mine, we mine the slush pile. There's, there's gold in there. Mm -hmm. And when you work with a writer, it's, um, do you think of, um, what are you most focused on? Are you most focused on getting the book sold? Or are you most focused on, do you think, oh, well, this is a writer that I want to still be working with when they're 50? Or what's your trajectory in the way that you work with writers? Well, I like to represent careers and not just one book. So um, I'm definitely. The first thing is to get that first book in the best possible shape so that you get the best possible deal and that if something happens with the publishing house and the editor leaves and then, you know, for some reason the editing falls through the cracks, the book is in pretty good enough shape to withstand that. And then, um, but I do think in terms of career and what's, what's the best for the writer and how we set up. So starting with these stories and then going to a novel 
is um, is a um, a good way to go. Sometimes sometimes it's better to start with the novel and then do stories. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I look for the long haul. I mean, I'm on third and fourth and fifth books with some of my clients. So. Who's the client you've been with? Who's been with? Where you've been together? Jonathan Franzen is my oldest client. Oh, is he? Were you back with him in the earlier books? Yes. Mm-hmm. Twenty Seven City was slush. Twenty Seven. Really? Yeah. I mean, it came to my boss as a referral from a referral. Uh-huh. Yeah. Chris, you were saying that when we were talking upstairs that um, one of the reasons that um, you liked Warren Wilson was that you liked the feeling of um, support. Is that something you really? Um, look for in an agent as well? Is that part of the relationship for you, that you feel not just supported but protected, sort of? Absolutely. I think not only in um, the case of an agent, but I also feel with my editors in a house as well. I mean, the meeting Susan, I felt very comfortable in her presence. For someone like me, if you read my book, you'll get a better idea of why, but I, I have a very low threshold for feeling unsafe. And uh, I think I felt very comfortable with Susan. I felt like I could trust her immediately. And I felt the same way when I spoke with Catherine for the first time on the phone, my editor. Um, I felt like this is a person I can really trust with my work, with, uh, with myself as a person. So it's very important to me. Mm-hmm. But I also think in the, at Warren Wilson, it gave me a community where people are supportive of your efforts. Um, the messy efforts that are in progress, and you really just want to bring a story to a workshop and hope that their words can help you improve it. And you don't want to bring something perfect and polished. That's not the point of a workshop. And it was the space where you could do it and feel like it was productive and uh, safe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I. What I'd like to do, I think, now is because I, I'm sure that the people in the audience have questions, is first ask you, do you have any questions for each other that you might want to ask, that you haven't, um, that you want to ask in front of a large audience and shop? <laughs> no. <laughs>